Uh, thank you, Andre, and it's a great honor to be able to present uh, this afternoon uh, to your community. Before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge my collaborators uh, who've contributed to the work I'll be presenting, Professor Catherine Flanagan at Carnegie Mellon University, Professor Kinshaw Law at Stanford University, Dr. Mohamed Atune at Thorne Tomasetti, and Mr. Peter Jansen with the Michigan Department of Transportation. And the title of the talk is Enhancing Infrastructure Management Through Data and Machine Learning Methods. Let me begin with just underscoring the importance of infrastructure, no matter what type of infrastructure we're talking about. Um, infrastructure that's necessary to support the prosperity of our society can be broadly classified into three types. There's essentially physical civil infrastructure, bridges, pipelines, dams, levees, what have you. There's also energy infrastructure uh, that's necessary to provide energy to our society. And there's also social infrastructure, such as parks, open air markets, areas where we build social capital as a society. Now, unfortunately, these infrastructure types are under stress from a number of different stressors, including natural hazards, which are being exasperated by climate change, such as rising sea levels and increasing storm intensity and frequency. We're seeing rapid trends of urbanization across the globe, resulting in high population growth which place high demand on our infrastructure. And then finally, in developed parts of the world where we have mature inventories of infrastructure, we see serious issues associated with infrastructure aging and the needs that aging infrastructure present. For example, in the case of aging infrastructure, the American Society of Civil Engineers every four years does a report card that assesses the condition of our national infrastructure. This report card was recently released for 2021, a few weeks ago, and overall our infrastructure received the grade of C minus. A key contributor to these poor conditions we're seeing in infrastructure is underinvestment in the space. It's projected that in the next 10 years, nearly $2.5 trillion of financing is necessary to maintain adequate condition of our infrastructure in the United States. Now, fortunately, there's new tools that are emerging that present opportunity to reinvent how we may manage this growing inventory of aging infrastructure. For example, we're seeing explosive use of sensors throughout our infrastructure systems, including sensors that are embedded directly into our infrastructure. We're seeing new ways of collecting data, such as the use of UAVs using photogrammetry to essentially collect spatial models of our infrastructure. Seeing connectivity to drive automation, such as connected vehicle technologies in our road systems. We're also seeing data sources associated with social systems, including computer vision methods applied to camera data, as well as the use of social media to better understand societal responses to ongoing activities in our society. In addition to sensors, we're seeing rapid evolution of computing technologies in a variety of different spaces. For example, we're seeing cloud-based services that provide on-demand scalability of computing resources, namely cloud-based uh, resources and tools. We're also seeing a shift from PDE-based modeling to more data-driven or machine learning type algorithms. And there's a revolution ongoing in the different type of machine learning algorithms that are being applied to engineering problems. We're seeing new concepts of uh, processing sensor data, looking at non-Nyquist asynchronous sampling and compressive sensing frameworks, and even the emergence of neuromorphic computational solutions that map machine learning algorithms and techniques directly into integrated circuits. In addition to the emergence of these new tools, there's also been the emergence of a new perspective within the infrastructure field, namely looking at systems. Historically, our field has largely looked at the robustness of our infrastructure systems on a component by component basis. But recent events reveal vulnerabilities and in system interdependencies. In addition to recognizing the importance of looking at infrastructure as systems or interconnected systems, we're also seeing that emerge in practice in the space such as smart cities, where we're seeing data and cyber interfaces driving interconnectivity between infrastructure, both physical infrastructure as well as cyber infrastructure. Now, the end result of some of these trends are what are often called cyber physical systems, which is the confluence of sensing and actuation with physical systems. So when we talk about a cyber physical system, we're really talking about an infrastructure system in our domain that has sensors embedded in it in the form of monitoring technologies or actuators in the form of control systems. 
Now, sensing and actuators by themselves do not render cyber physical systems. There's many examples of monitoring and control systems been applied, but one would not classically refer to these as cyber physical systems. Examples include control systems to control buildings to earthquakes, as well as monitoring systems to measure the behavior of structures to earthquakes. What makes cyber physical systems different than these traditional monitoring control systems is the integration of computing resources with that data so that one can improve the way one monitors the physical system or controls the physical system. These physical systems uh, are enhanced through the use of computing, opening up opportunity to aggregate data and then apply data-driven algorithms to process that data. We can also embed sensors directly into the physical system in the form of embedded wireless sensors and move some of those computing resources directly to those sensors allowing for edge-based or fog-based computing of data directly in the physical system. Now, there's a tremendous opportunity through the use of these computing resources to essentially explore the adoption of machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms to process the data that we're collecting to improve our understanding of the performance of the physical system or to improve our ability to control or automate that physical system. There's many examples of cyber physical systems throughout our civil infrastructure field, including early earthquake warning systems, connected and autonomous vehicles, as well as autonomous UAVs that are used today for inspecting structures across the United States. Now, in today's presentation, I'd like to highlight one application of a cyber physical system that we've deployed here in the state of Michigan, looking at integrating structural health monitoring systems installed on bridge infrastructure to essentially combine that with computer vision as well as cloud-based computing to better understand how loads are being imposed on those bridge structural health monitoring systems. Towards that end, our cyber physical systems will integrate with bridge health monitoring other types of data sources, including image data from cameras that we can use to track, uh, essentially track trucks, as well as connectivity technologies to also track autonomous uh, vehicles on our roads. Now, our cyber physical system is deployed along a 20 mile corridor close to our campus in Southeast Michigan. It's called the Interstate 275 corridor. And along that corridor are two bridges that have structural health monitoring systems permanently installed in them, the Telegraph Road Bridge, as well as the Newburgh Road Bridge. There's a series of traffic cameras that are installed along that corridor, as is a way in motion system that allows us to measure essentially the gross vehicle weight and the weight of of axles of trucks moving through that particular corridor. The first bridge we have monitors called the Telegraph Road Bridge, which is a pretty standard steel girder concrete deck bridge that's widely used across the United States as well as in Europe. This bridge is roughly 40 years old and is in relatively good condition, although it has had a recent history of some deterioration, including severe deck uh, cracking, as well as uh, distress of abutment uh, structures. A unique feature of the structure is use of a pin and hanger detail, which is often a fracture critical detail in structures necessitating vigilant inspection strategies by the owner. We deployed a bridge monitoring system in this particular bridge back in 2010. It consists of 38 wireless sensor nodes collecting over 70 channels of data. Uh, this is largely a monitoring system for research purposes, uh, which is one of the reasons for the large number of sensing channels. The majority of the sensors are strain gauges that are used to essentially measure the flexural response of the bridge to truck loads. So we have metal foil gauges through the height of some of the steel girders, as well as a BDI IntelliDucer to measure strain within the concrete deck. Also, because of the unique design of this particular bridge using hanger plates, we've also densely instrumented four hanger plates uh, in that bridge structure, as you see here. This system uh, is largely designed around the use of the Narada wireless sensor node, which was developed in my laboratory back in 2005 and has been deployed in a variety of different field applications. These wireless sensors essentially allow for different types of sensors to attach to them. They're solar powered using rechargeable lead acid batteries, and they also have wireless telemetry that can communicate data from the sensor node to a base station installed at the site. You can see here a picture of the monitoring system installed in Telegraph Road Bridge, including solar panels along one of the girder lines shown here, 
And there's a corresponding base station that's going to aggregate that data and communicate it to the cloud services that we've implemented implement in Microsoft Azure. We essentially attach sensors using magnets to attach the sensor to the steel components of the structure. And you can see one of our Narada sensor nodes in its weatherproof enclosure shown here. That data is then communicated to a base station, which is a single board computer running Linux, where we aggregate the data and then communicate it over a cellular interface to cloud services. In addition to Telegraph Road Bridge, we have a second bridge monitor, the Newburgh Road Bridge, which is almost as old as the Telegraph Road Bridge. This is a bridge that's in relatively good condition, similar to the Telegraph Road Bridge, and is a single span uh, supported by two abutment structures, so no hanger plates on this particular structure. This has a lighter weight uh, monitoring system installation consisting of only 10 sensing channels that are largely uh, strain based, again, measuring the flexural response of the structure under traffic loads. In addition to the bridge health monitoring systems, we have a way in motion system that's embedded directly in the interstate, which measures essentially vehicle gross weight, vehicle speed, number of axles, axle spacing, and axle weights. And you can see a picture of essentially uh, this type two WIMS based station embedded directly in the road. There's also traffic cameras installed along the roadway. You can see a picture here of a typical view from that traffic camera of the Telegraph Road Bridge along I-275. However, to enhance the capabilities to record through vision, essentially the truck traffics in the corridor, we deployed our own sensing systems roadside at both the bridges as well as at the way in motion station. This particular monitoring system is shown here, essentially it includes a webcam and a weatherproof enclosure as well as a GPU-based uh, single board computer that we uh, co-locate with that camera to both operate that camera, process that data using embedded detectors that have been machine learned, as well as to communicate data to the cloud through a cellular modem. And again, this roadside camera is powered uh, by the solar power. In addition, deploying these monitoring systems to the different bridges, as well as at the way in motion station, we have a cloud-based uh, solution that allows us to aggregate that data and manage that data. Uh, through collaborations with Professor Kinchel Law at Stanford University, we've deployed a number of different uh, NoSQL-based uh, database solutions. One at the bridge site that essentially consists of a Mongo database uh, embedded server in those single board computers at the base station. And then up in Microsoft Azure, we have a Cassandra-based uh, database solution that also combines sensor data with a digital twin representation. So essentially using bridge information models to provide contextual representation of the structure that we're monitoring to give a linkage between the data we're collecting and the different structural components. One of the uses of the cyber physical system is to trigger the operation of the system. For many years, we operate the system on a schedule, essentially turning the system on every four hours and collecting two minutes of data. But we sought to optimize the use of the solar energy that we have for each of our sensors through the use of triggering. The way that we'll perform triggering is we'll use computer vision to identify trucks in the corridor. Once we've identified trucks, we then trigger each of the observation points in the corridor, namely the two bridges, as well as the way in motion station to collect that data. This allows us to track truck loads as they move through the corridor and then link the response that we're measuring at each of the bridges to the measurement of the truck load that's being measured at the way in motion station. The way we do that is we put a camera right at the beginning of Interstate I-275, right where uh, it joins Interstate 75 at the Ohio-Michigan border. This camera will automate the detection of trucks using an embedded detector and then trigger the collection of data at each of the other observation points in the corridor at the two bridges and the way in motion station. We do this based on an estimation of the speed of the vehicle and then essentially gating the on and off time of data collection at each of those bridge sites. The way we'll do that is through the use of embedding a single stage object detector. Uh, we essentially looked at a variety of different uh, detectors, including RetinaNet, SSD, among uh, others, and settled on the use of YOLO, uh, which is a very popular single stage object detector that's well known for its precision and accuracy, but its computational efficiency. YOLO essentially consists of a convolutional neural network architecture 
that operates as a filter bank to process images uh, as shown here. Um, it essentially converts the image into a tensor of dense predictions via regression. And then based on those predictions and uh, Nomi's uh, expression is to identify objects with a confidence score of the classification of that object. So the output is a prediction of the object through the use of a bounding box, the probability or the confidence score of that box, as well as the confidence score associated with each of the classifications. We use version three of YOLO for implementation for offline detection that we do up in the cloud. This is a 53 layer uh, resi residual based uh, convoluted neural network. But for real time execution roadside, we use a tiny version or a lightweight version of YOLO version three for online detection. And this is a much shallower convoluted neural network backbone with only 13 convolutional layers. We perform transfer learning. So we use essentially the pre-trained version of YOLO, which is trained for general purpose uh, objects, and then do uh, training on curated data sets that have been assembled from images collected from our roadside uh, cameras. Shown here is the curated library of truck types. We're trying to train this detector to automate the detection of heavy uh, trucks in our corridor. So we assemble a library consisting of truck images from online libraries, as well as those directly from our roadside in a variety of different uh, lighting conditions and weather uh, conditions. We have over 3,500 images that have over 5,500 truck instances. And you can see the breakdown of uh, object types within that data set between trucks, pickup trucks, which are lightweight or small trucks and cars. We'll use a number of different metrics to essentially assess the performance of those object detectors, uh, largely relying on precision and recall. Um, in this presentation, I'll highlight the use of average precision and mean average precision for highlighting the performance of our object detector. Shown here is the performance of our YOLO detector roadside uh, based on an NVIDIA GPU. Uh, again, that's been embedded roadside with each of the cameras. You can see the mean average precision for a given intersection over a union for detection, as well as a breakdown of that average precision for each of the different classifications shown here, showing performance of 90% or higher for most classification types. Once we have that system operation, you can see how it works. We have a truck detected down at the beginning of that corridor that then triggers essentially the data collection at the Telegraph Road Bridge, where we see the truck again. Later, we'll see at the Newburgh Road Bridge. And then finally, that truck will reemerge out at the Way in Motion station shown here. Now, in terms of how we process the data that we've collected from that cyber physical system, let me begin highlighting how we process the bridge response data to essentially detect the presence of a truck. So, shown here, for example, is the Newburgh Road Bridge that has sensors embedded. Typical uh, response of strain corresponding to different trucks coming over over a period of observation. And this is roughly for a two minute period. We'll essentially look at uh, time, his, uh, time synchronized measures of strain and be able to assign a truck to a given lane. So in this case, the truck is assigned to the slow lane. This allows us to generate a truck presence metric matrix. We then look at traffic images, and again, based on definition of lane assignment, based on processing of the image. Once we have the bounding box that's identified the truck, we can essentially use the lower right corner of that bounding box to assign that truck to a lane, and then produce a truck presence matrix from the image data. We can correlate that data between essentially our bridge monitoring system and our camera system to essentially fine tune the time synchronization between these two independent data processing uh, tools in that corridor. Once we have that, the question is, is the truck that we're seeing at the bridge in the bridge response data, is it the same truck that we see then at the corresponding camera? To do that, we're looking at pairwise matching using our image data. So looking at uh, the response data and the image data at the bridges, as well as with the WIM station, in addition to between the bridges. We'll essentially extract a vector associated with each of the images that we have at each uh, image point in the system, so at each bridge and the way in motion station, and use a similarity measure based on the distance, the Euclidean distance between those feature vectors. Once we do that for a given uh, 
a set of observation points, say at the Telegraph Road Bridge compared to the Newburgh Road Bridge, that Euclidean distance will provide a score for different trucks. So the x-axis here is assignment of trucks at the Newburgh Road Bridge, and the y-axis is the trucks identified at the Telegraph Road Bridge. And what you see in this matrix here is the corresponding Euclidean distance, where a high score suggests strong similarity. Once we identify trucks over a certain threshold, we'll then use these trucks to see if those are the same trucks to make a final determination of which of these pairs is the actual pair for the same truck. To do that, we're essentially using re-identification based on an embedding network, a triplet embedded network. Again, we'll use YOLO version three tiny, uh, looking at feeding into this network uh, ANC images as well as positive and negative images to determine if essentially uh, the object that we're seeing at one uh, camera image is the same at another uh, image. And the loss function associated with training of this triplet embedded network is looking at the distance between same trucks as well as to similar trucks to give this particular triplet loss network the ability to differentiate the same truck or different trucks. Again, we have a customized data set for training. So we have a re-identification data set that has over 1,000 truck pairs with each pair belonging to the same truck. We also will essentially enrich that library by flipping both horizontally and vertically that image set to give us additional data for training. Shown here is a comparison of our um, essentially YOLO version three triplet network in comparison to some more uh, wide or short baseline based approaches to uh, re-identification of the same objects. There is some false positive pairs that are matched by the algorithm, but the performance of it is quite high. Once we have that system operating, we're collecting bridge response data at each of the bridges that have been linked to the same truck event. We also have a direct quantitative measure of the weight of that truck that's inducing the bridge response. So the significance now of the cyber physical system is for the first time, we have infrastructure response data with an actual direct quantitative measure of the load that's imposing that response. And this is a game-changing opportunity to how we utilize that data. Some uses of the data can be looking at the correlation of behavior between bridges in the same corridor to the same set of truckloads. And you'll see some empirical relationships of correlation of peak strain at mid span in the telegraph road bridge against gross vehicle weight as measured by our way in motion station, or peak strain between the two bridges. And what we see is linear relationships as we would expect for a linear behavior uh, bridge system. Now, what do we use in this unique data set in our particular application? One is to look at the correlation analysis to explore the response relationship between bridges. We're currently looking at building a predictive uh, sequence to sequence time series models so that we can predict the output or the behavior of one bridge based on a measured response at another bridge along the same corridor. This potentially can be used to control uh, truck loads to minimize, for example, the dynamic amplification on the structure. We're also looking at using this data to assess the residual capacity of our bridges through load rating methods, but that are largely data driven. And we're also using this data for asset management decision making, looking at the use of reliability frameworks to empower data driven risk assessment methods. But for the remaining few minutes of this talk, I'd like to highlight some of our data driven load rating methods. Load rating methods are often done based on either empirically or done analytically. Analytically, there are simplified methods that are based on mechanics based models or alternatively, analytical methods can be based on more sophisticated finite element models based on calibration. The typical analytical or simplified approach is often referred to as the load and resistance factor rating method, which is usually done based on simple line girder analytical methods. It's essentially looking at the capacity, taking off essentially your uh, dead loads that are associated with the weight of the particular structure, divided by the live load with specific uh, calibration constants associated with each. If you look at this particular load rating formula, you'll see the live load and the um, essentially the dynamic load allowance in the corresponding denominator of that rating factor. But because of the data that we've collected, we have a direct measure of that live load and impact factor that's associated with the bridge. Often this is where uh, these methods are known to be extremely conservative. 
uh, largely because these live loads are calculated without considering the true systemic behavior of the structure. Also, the amplification factor or the dynamic load allowance is an empirically derived value, which is often set at 0.33, which is also conservative. Given our data set that we have, we can actually uh, extract the live load as well as the IM measure directly from the data that we have. One of the challenges though, is to convert it into an equivalent notional design load known as the HL93 design load, which is widely used for bridge load ratings. So in our particular approach, we'll collect bridge response data. We can extract a static bridge response from that data through low pass filtering. Once we have that, we can extract out the dynamic load allowance or the IM factor or the impact factor. Taking out the static response, uh, we can essentially process those static responses to do a unit influence line analysis empirically, and then combine that with the notional HL93 design load to essentially perform our load rating. I'll just highlight some of the results that we have. Shown here is a typical response measure. Uh, this corresponds to the telegraph road bridge. You can see the dynamic response of the different colored strain measure, and then the corresponding low pass filtered static response that we'll subtract out. We can then differentiate between the two for the peak response of the dynamic and the static response, normalize it against the static response to determine the dynamic load allowance factor. We actually know the load that corresponded to that response measure, and that will be important in this particular uh, study. We're essentially going to look at different combinations of load for the different lane assignments. On each of these bridges, we have three lanes, a slow lane, a medium lane, and a fast lane. And we'll look at different load combinations between the different girder responses that we measured with our strain gauges and the assignment of the truck in the different uh, lanes that exist on that particular structure. Shown here is an extraction of the dynamic load allowance empirically for over two years worth of data. We're essentially looking at data within a region of interest that's centered on essentially the uh, nominal gross vehicle weight of the HL93 design load. We essentially will process that particular data to extract out um, essentially the dynamic load allowance. So we'll take the mean and three standard deviations off that mean to give us a empirically derived dynamic load allowance uh, for that specific bridge that represents that systemic behavior. We also extract out unit influence lines because we know the axle spacing as well as the gross vehicle weight and the axial weights as measured by our way in motion station. This is a simple least squares problem that we can uh, perform using the measurement data that we collect on the bridge structure to extract out a unit influence line. Shown here is the extracted influence line for the different truck lanes, uh, girder line uh, combinations. Um, again, these have been empirically derived as shown here for the Newburgh Road Bridge. Once we have that, we can perform now a data-driven LRFR uh, load rating methods. And you can see some of the results here, uh, both at an inventory level rating factor as well as an operating level rating factor. The takeaways from these results is that the approach proposes a more rational approach for analytical uh, analysis through the LRFR method for load rating. The reason it's a more rational and helpful approach is because it represents the real world systemic behavior of the bridge. A key feature of the approach that we propose is to ensure for apple to apple comparisons, we use essentially the HL93 equivalency load based on the data that we've extracted. Even though the data we've extracted comes from different load types, we can equate that into an HL93 nominal load. This method is proven to be less conservative uh, and more accurate for uh, LRFR load rating analysis. And it's a cheaper method for load rating compared to a finite element model that needs to be calibrated. So just in conclusions, what this talk aimed to present was a cyber physical system architecture for end user decision-making looked at applying these tools largely um, in a highway corridor for asset management of bridge structures. But these methods are also being explored for a variety of other applications that my team is working on, including automated sensor deployment using autonomous aerial vehicles. And you see a video of automated landing on landing patterns for sensor installation and structures. We're also using these computer vision and re-identification methods to automate the detection of social behavior and social capital in a variety of social infrastructure applications, including in parks and open air markets. 
So again, thank you for the opportunity to share some of my group's work with you this afternoon. And uh, I'm grateful for the invitation to present uh, today and a special thank you to Andre and Ernst uh, for the invitation. Thank you very much.